Hello and welcome to the Science of Mass Effect Andromeda, where we're playing through Mass Effect Andromeda and uh, talking about its science and about the narrative uh, and the kind of literary analysis of the story. We've just arrived on the Nexus, uh, which is supposed to be the glorious new center of our new uh, Milky Way civilization in this Andromeda galaxy. But unfortunately, things seem to have not gone so well. And next is short on supplies, they had an uprising, uh, a bunch of people were left or were exiled. And the Nexus, uh, yeah, now and we are the first ARC to arrive here after Nexus has been on their own for about a year. Uh, we've just been managed to give them enough power to be able to switch on the lights. Uh, so they're happy about that, we have this lovely view to look at. Uh, and while we look at this view, I thought it would be interesting to just quickly uh, think back on the prologue we had and how that uh, kind of nicely uh, recaps the themes of the original Mass Effect trilogy, right? Uh, so themes had was you know the conflict and the resolution of that conflict between uh, synthetic and organic life, AI and, and organic life, and kind of uh, in the ending of the prologue. We, we have that resolution, kind of the similar resolution uh, to the ending, at least I chose for Mass Effect 3, where Shepard merges with AI and causes all uh, organic and synthetic life to kind of merge, right? Uh, also harkens back a bit to the ending of Ghost in the Shell, come to think of it. But anyway, uh, we get the same thing kind of in the ending of this prologue, right? Where Sam merges with us, with, with Scott Ryder somehow in some way we don't quite fully understand yet but it seems to be the same kind of idea as the ending of, of ME3 and also we get uh, the closure of a uh, child-parent relationship right where our father gives his life for us and pays ultimate sacrifice transfers all his power and knowledge in the form of Sam to us transfers his authority his pathfinder to us uh, and then it is up to us to make a new future So, uh, it'll be interesting to see whether uh, these themes being kind of closed out in the, the prologue, whether that's a sign, uh, you know, that the devs are, are done with these themes, that they want to move on to something new, or whether that it's uh, really just introducing these themes and that they want to continue on those themes in, in this game. Uh, we'll find out. Um, what's also interesting is that uh, Scott Ryder seems to be going to be heading out on a, a hero's journey. A hero's journey is a, a term that's used a lot. Um, I don't know if everyone's familiar with it, so I'll give you a brief introduction. Uh, it was thought up by uh, this guy, Joseph Campbell. Uh, he wrote this book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And Joseph Campbell was an anthropologist. He wrote this book, uh, I think, in the 50s, maybe the early 60s, oh no, 1949 even. Uh, and yeah, St. Joseph Campbell, he was an anthropologist and he analyzed uh, lots of myths from various cultures all around the world, uh, you know, from Polynesia, Africa, America, Europe, wherever. And he said, well, there's this kind of general theme if you kind of abstract away all the differences and, and look, you know, what kind of story elements do we find? Very often there's what he called the hero's journey, where there's a certain hero, he kind of sketches it out, I don't know if you can see it here, um, it's a circular pattern, uh, but anyway, there's a hero who's called forth to adventure, meets some helpers along the way, has to uh, fight a, a threshold guardian or gain access across a threshold between our normal world and an underworld or a metaphysical realm, uh, which kind of lets him peek behind uh, often is a him, unfortunately, because patriarchy and all that. Um, yeah, he lets him peek behind the curtain of our world, gain new knowledge, new understanding. Uh, sometimes he has to fight an ultimate evil, or he's actually the opposite, kind of redeemed uh, by, by the gods or whatever. Uh, and then in the end, the hero returns to our world, back across the threshold, but transformed and armed with this new knowledge or, or new gifts to bestow uh, upon the world. Okay, it can take various forms exactly, but you know if you look at lots of myths or um, 
Now, a lot of, of stories, even movies today, uh, you'll find this hero's journey motif, right? Uh, of course, Star Wars, Star Wars uh, is a, a very famous example, and if I'm not mistaken, George Lucas consciously modeled his story on the hero's journey, right? He really wanted Luke Skywalker to have a classical hero's journey that would fit in this motif. Um, well, so Tolkien, uh, of course, Tolkien knew a lot about mythology. I don't know if he was familiar with the hero's journey, but he certainly would have been familiar with elements of it, I guess, through studying mythology himself. Uh, so, you know, Frodo goes on a hero's journey, Bilbo goes on a hero's journey. Uh, and it's a motif you see a lot. And uh, Joseph Campbell argues uh, that's kind of connected to how human psychology and the human mind works. Pulls in a lot of Freudian psychology. I'm not sure whether, I think most of that is, is kind of not accepted as being true anymore by the, the psychological community or by psychologists. Uh, also, Joseph Campbell, you know, it's, he worked in the 50s, so I'm sure there's been more recent scholarship since then. Um, I'm not really familiar with much anthropology, but if you know, any of you have any uh, knowledge on that, I'd love to hear from you in the comments, if you have any thoughts on that. Um, because, you know, I'm aware that, that probably, you know, there, there's been new thoughts since Joseph Campbell. Uh, but anyway, so also Mass Effect likes this, this hero's journey uh, motif, right? So uh, Shepard goes on three hero's journeys, basically. Uh, one in each Mass Effect game. Where in the first game, uh, they're called forth to fight this, this Geth uh, threat. Uh, they go out, they learn the knowledge of the Protheans, and then come back transformed by the knowledge of the Protheans to defeat Sovereign. And try and you know, warn people about the Reapers. In Mass Effect 2, uh, they die at the beginning, they're resurrected by Cerberus, they go out to this collector base, learn more of the truth of the Reapers. Uh, and again, come back, and then in the third uh, game, you know, you actually have to f really fight the Reapers. They're now here, and you again trans gain transformative knowledge, right, of, of the purpose of the Reapers and and the interconnectedness between organic and synthetic life, and you get the ability to resolve that conflict one way or the other. Uh, and it seems uh, that also here, the game is setting up, uh, us up for another hero's journey, right? Scott Ryder, uh, just an average person, kinda, I mean, not super average. Um, okay, just a, a lowish ranking member of, of the Pathfinder team, uh, who's now thrust into this role of Pathfinder. He has a call to adventure, right? The Nexus is in trouble, and he needs to, uh, to help out. Um, my screen is just frozen up, but hopefully it's just my screen, uh, not the video. So Scott Ryder, uh, low ranking Pathfinder, uh, who's now uh, thrust into the role of Pathfinder, uh, has to help the Nexus, help humanity find habitable worlds, uh, not just humanity actually, but all the Andromeda colonists find habitable worlds to live on, uh, and he's kind of has the, the refusal of the call as well. Right? It's also an element you often see where, where people don't want to go on adventure, they like their ordinary life they're living. Uh, Scott Ryder has a little bit when he says, you know, uh, I'm not ready, uh, how can I step into my father's footsteps? Uh, but yeah, it looks very much at the moment as if the game is setting us up for another hero's journey. What I find a very interesting twist on the hero's journey is, is what Mass Effect is doing with what they find the threshold. Uh, right, so the hero in the hero's journey has to cross a threshold into the, the metaphysical world or the, the kind of supernatural world behind the curtain of everyday reality. Uh, and one common motif where you can cross a threshold is by dying, right? Of course, then you get up and end up in the underworld, etc. Uh, or the afterlife. But in Mass Effect, Death is not what brings you across the threshold, it is the call to adventure, right? Uh, in Mass Effect 2, Shepard dies right at the beginning and then is resurrected by Cerberus. And this death and resurrection doesn't serve as crossing the threshold and then transforming the knowledge, get, getting transformative knowledge. It is the call to adventure, right? So after that 
Cerberus says, hey, we brought you back from the dead because we need to go fix this thing. Same thing here, Scott Ryder. We died. Uh, the game makes a point of telling us that. You know, we were clinically dead for 22 seconds. I'll talk about clinically dead later if you have a long walk or something. We were clinically dead for 22 seconds. Uh, and then we came back to life. But that, as far as we can see here, hasn't transformed us. You know, it was just the call to adventure. That was during that process, you know, we we received the role of Pathfinder. So, it's just, so where Mass Effect is saying, that, you know, all that, that death and dying stuff, you know, that's not really what will transform us. That's not really the challenge. Overcoming death is not the challenge we face. It is dealing with, with AI and with what has come before and being ready for that. That is the real transformative knowledge that the Shepard gains, right? Um, if, you, if you look at Shepard, because of course we haven't seen much of Ryder's story yet, uh, but if you look at Shepard, uh, then what has a transformative effect on Shepard is... Hello, what kind of race are you? Are you Arturi? Uh, what has a transformative effect on Shepard is not dying, right? I mean, Shepard dies, is dead for two years, uh, not just kind of in a coma, sort of, but, but really dead. And for two years at the beginning of Mass Effect 2, then is resurrected, but is not really affected uh, by that. It was affected far more by all the, the, the Prothean cipher, the knowledge of the Protheans, and the visions of the re coming of the Reapers uh, that they have. And it is that that has really transformed Shepard rather than just dying and resurrecting. So it's a very interesting uh, spin on the, the standard hero's journey. Right, let's go talk to the Director of Colonial Affairs. Alright, what happened? To who? To whom? And your goddamn father. Wow. Sorry, my face is tired from dealing with everything. And right now I just want to know what happened with Alec. Uh, why can't I just tell her that? I don't want to get into it. Things went wrong. And now I'm the one you have to deal with. Alec Ryder wouldn't accept that kind of ultimatum. Damned if I will. We'd never have left home if we... <sighs> Not home. The Milky Way. This is home. This mess. We don't have a lot of options, Ryder. Maybe you'll prove your father right. After 14 months of failed colonization, forgive me if I don't hold my breath. Uh, I'll forgive her. Um... But, uh, yeah, I mean, why can't we just tell her what happened? I don't think it's unreasonable for her to, to want to know that. No, especially she, she is the leader around here, one of the leaders. How do you fit into the Nexus leadership? I oversee the actual settlement effort. As the number of outposts is currently less than ideal, my influence is limited. As Tan is quick to remind me, left a perfectly adequate career as a chief officer. Provincial capital, too. Only a new galaxy could pull me away. And here we are, idling. Again, this is a question which we as players don't know, but I would certainly hope that the character would know, right? Uh, especially, like Ryder, as a member of the Pathfinder team, he's quite an important team. He should have a clear knowledge already of you know, how the leadership structure at least was supposed to work. I think we've heard, you know, things have gone wrong and that, you know, people have been had to be succeeded. Uh, but in principle, this was the leadership type of structure that was always supposed to be in place. Uh, but of course, you know, somehow they have to explain this to the player, which who hasn't gone through all the preparation and training that Alec Ryder has. Um, there's also sounds of some friction between her and Tan, and especially power struggle type of friction, which is not good. You called my father Alec. No one does that. A lot of us joined the initiative because of his vision. What he shared of it, anyway. Were you friends? Or... I'm not your new mother, if that's what you're asking. Or his friend. He hated that I didn't use his title. But no one's a pathfinder until they've path found something. Much like a colonial director without colonies. Fair enough. There must be some kind of plan for encountering hostile aliens. We can't have been that naive. We expected life, not an enemy that refuses to talk. 
They don't attack. They disinfect. We're nothing until we're bacteria. Sorry, 14 months and you stoop to poetry. That's how bad it is. Not sure who started it, but we're calling them Ket. Kandros will know more. Maybe too much. You don't trust him? I trust him to defend us. I do not trust a rising military influence in a supposedly civilian initiative. We came here to make history, Ryder. Not repeat it. Ugh, oh, goddamn poetry. Nothing wrong with poetry, Edison. You've had no colony successes in over a year. How many tries is that? Less than you'd think. The Scourge, Spoiled Worlds, Exiles, Hostiles. We can't just plop down an outpost and expect picket fences. We need the Pathfinder and Sam to scout, evaluate, and inspire. The Initiative promised a goal. Andromeda has not cooperated. And if it had? Beautiful, utopian horseshit. Colonies that produce and support each other. The Nexus as Citadel. Not headed by Tan. Or even me. Hmm. Well, by who then? And that's really the question you should be asking. But apparently we can't. There's also the strange technology. Has anyone studied that? We've tried. Not me. The brains in research. They're supposed to know their business. The current excuse? The tech we dug up on Mars was more advanced, but it was plug and go. The tech here thinks different? I don't know. We've mostly avoided it. And from what the Hyperion logs say about Alec, maybe that's good. So why are you asking about my father if you know where from the logs? Um, also, lady, scientific research is hard. Excuse me, Director Addison. Ryder? It's Pathfinder. Ryder, we're starving here. If we don't get a foundation of outposts to feed the initiative, we might as well be 600 years dead. Alec promised a lot. None of it panned out. That's what you're up against. Why people won't trust you. Why I don't trust you. Prove me wrong. Well, I, I respect that she's, you know, open about it. Uh, I don't blame her. She's had 14 months of dealing with this mess. I just woke up. Uh, you know, and she, she's open about the fact she doesn't trust me, and there's every reason to. Or, or not to trust me, let's say. So, yeah. Fair enough. Please be advised that Hyperion docking procedures are now. Um. Speak of ten last. Um, let me think. I was promised to talk about clinically dead. Uh, yeah. So clinically dead is a, uh, a specific type of dead. Uh, you might want a type of dead, uh, because dead is actually surprisingly hard to define, uh, right? Because our body is composed of cells. Uh, some of our cells die all the time, right? Your skin is mainly dead cells, at least the top layer. They renew each other all the time, or themselves all the time. Um, you know, and, and your heart can stop uh, for about a minute or so even. That can be survivable with the right medical attention. Um, Vice versa, your your brain can stop, even without your heart stopping, depending on, on what parts of your brain, right? So, it becomes very murky when exactly you are dead and what to define as dead, right? Also, if you are, what we usually define as dead, you know, some of your cells might keep on living for another couple of days. I'm not quite sure how long it takes them to stop, right? So, so clinically, that is just this kind of definition saying, well. You know, if, if we see these kind of properties in a body, then that person is not going to become alive anymore. So we call them dead, even if some other functions still work. Uh, and certainly now in, in the 20th century uh, or 21st century, as far as I know, uh, that's mainly looking at brain activity, right? If certain regions of the brain show no activity at all, uh, then you are dead, right? There's this no way you are going to, to wake up 
uh, in any way. Um, so, uh, we might all just call you dead. And so that is then defined as being clinically dead. Let uh, me look through this. Uh -huh. Foster Edison, CEO for Provincial Capital. Uh, provincial Capital, where on what planet? You stay Provincial Capital. She likes can carry responsibility without requiring a public face. I can, I can see that. Uh, or you would like something like that. Uh, but then she's going to go to head uh, colonial affairs. And that's very much a public position, I'd say. Except that after being short, it was temporary. After arrival, I posted the point of council and she could remain obscure on a new world. And she'll be senior advisor to Jen Carson. Of course, Carson died. So that also makes a lot of sense. So not only does Edison have to deal with mess, she also has to be a public face in a role she's not at all comfortable with. Appears to be exactly the job she didn't want, indeed. And unfortunately she's taking some of that out on me. I guess we have to kind of accept that. The cats. Uh, Angel known as cats. We don't know exactly why. So interested in certain kind of uh, technology that's around here, but we don't know why. Okay. Prosperity, in case initiative goes belly up. Nexus is a four-ring circus. Don't like it. Fan operates, and his disdain for the program is obvious. I believe his intentions are ultimately good, but it's opportunist who's likely to create dissent. Don't see Nexus coming together if he's left unchecked. It's really polarizing. Anderson, she's taking the queue to circle the wagons. I think you can talk to Candles about this, at least try to get the two of us more coordinated. Or maybe not. Seriously hate this kind of drama. I can imagine, and uh, this sounds an awful lot like heading for... Uh, round two of the rebellions, uprisings, whatever you want to call. Also, that is seriously not the kind of uh, writing you want to just leave lying around on, on a crypto data pad like that, right? Uh, if Director Tan were to read that, uh, you would not be happy. Hyperion docking unannounced caused some switches to blow. That's fine. I don't care. We know the problem is more widespread than we thought. We're working to fix it. That's all. Um, so yeah, obviously somebody needs to read some Game of Thrones. There you are. Hope the others haven't been giving you a hard time. There's a lot that needs doing. At least with the Hyperion hooked up and feeding us power, my team and I can get more work done. Very good. I already like Cash. What kind of work do you do as superintendent? I was part of the team that originally designed and built this place. I keep the station functional, or as functional as possible, considering. So, it's a really important job, right? If the Nexus is the, the, the center of... supposed to be the center of our new civilization, uh, and then to have a, a titles mundane as a superintendent, right, which kind of feels kind of not very high up a hierarchy. Um, I mean, maybe that's just the feeling I get with the word, but it's kind of like, seems to be intentional to kind of downplay how much political power you might otherwise get, right, as, as running this really important station, but you're only a superintendent, so obviously kind of designed to, to push this person filling this role away from the political power in this new uh, civilization. I noticed there aren't a lot of Krogan around. You haven't spoken to number eight yet, have you? Number eight? Tan. 
Ask him why most of my people left. He'll have opinions. I can tell you this much. When the mutiny happened, a deal was made. My clan were supposed to settle matters and in return, get more say in the initiative. Why do you call Tan eight? Because he was eighth in line to take over the Andromeda initiative. I like to remind him of that now and then. Keep him humble. Uh, depending on Tan's character, that, that might backfire spectacularly, but yeah, fair enough. Did the deal go through? The clan held up their part, but Tan had a meltdown when he found out we wanted more say around here. Then Addison's assistant, Spender, pretended he never made the deal in the first place. It was a mess, but I don't blame my people for walking out. We're done being used. Fair enough. With your clan gone, why did you stay? It's complicated. The station and my clan both need me here. What sort of problems have you seen in the Nexus? Situations gone to shit pretty much sums it up. There's arcs missing. Some idiots tried to mutiny and take over, then more idiots offended my clan, so they left. And to top it all off, the founder of the initiative, Jian Garson, was killed. What happened to Jean Garson? Killed in the Scourge disaster. Her and a bunch of the other leaders. Tan might know more. Wonder why she... I'm not sure if Cash is supposed to be he or she. Um, I wonder why they were... Uh... I mean, okay, they're not super affectionate about Jen Garson, but it sounds like they at least were a fan. When all of Garson's message seems to be very much about humanity rather than all species. And I thought the Hyperion had it bad when we arrived. Anything else? The outposts aren't happening because we don't have resources or people, so Addison's more uptight than ever. And let's not forget how badly the station was damaged on arrival. But that's a detail, according to some. My team and I are repairing what we can. If we don't get material soon, things will go downhill. Fast. Noted. Um, quick side note, which is through all of Mass Effect, and obviously for budgetary reasons during development of the game, but all these screens just show kind of meaningless animations, which don't appear to be showing any kind of useful information. But then, no screens in Mass Effect have ever done that, and I can understand why. When we left the Milky Way, the Krogan were still dealing with the Genophage. Right, the Genophage. A little gift to our people from the Solarians thousands of years ago. That sterility virus they infected us with left most of our children stillborn. Only one in a thousand survive. No wonder your people have such a problem with Solarians. Some wounds never heal. Not that my ancestors didn't provoke it. They did try to conquer the galaxy. The Solarians were forced to respond. And it's not fair to blame it all on them, either. The Solarians developed the virus, but it was the Turians who deployed it. I'm hoping that's all in the past. Plenty of blame to go around, but Andromeda is about new beginnings. My people need that more than most. What about the Krogan here in Andromeda? There's no cure for it. But my clan was starting to show a mutation against the virus. A natural defense. During the trip to get here, Krogan underwent gene therapies to enhance the mutation while we were in stasis. So you used those 600 years to your advantage. Gave the adaptation more time to develop. Yeah. It's still early, but I think we made a dent. Our scientists say we've improved viability to almost 4%, which is a lot better than what we had. Beyond all the statistics, it means more Krogan children will live. It's the only way my people have a future out here. Nothing more for now. See you later. My crew's working on it. We've moved the op center to the top of our priority list. That's an entire sector showing green. Good job, you two. I like Kish more and more. myself as soon as I have a moment. Move on to the docks for now. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, what Cash doesn't know is that the Genophage has been cured. They're back in the Milky Way. Um, 
yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting that, that even though they're in stasis, apparently they can still modify their genes. Which makes it very weird how the stasis works, right? Because you can expect suspended animation to kind of stop all cellular metabolism and activity, right? So you don't age and, and yeah, nothing happens to you. But then how do you get genes to continue mutation, mutating? Uh, adaptation, by the way, is a very specific biology term, and that indeed really means kind of changes that you undergo as a species uh, that allow you to prosper in a certain environment, which could be, you know, dealing with the fact that there is a virus always around. Uh, anyway, that's been about half an hour, so I think it's a good point to uh, end this episode. Nothing much happened, uh, hopefully you can... Uh, spend a bit less time discussing heroes' journeys and more time on actually advancing the stories next episode. I hope you will join me again for that uh, for now. Thanks for watching and see you soon.